Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Hi, Charles and Margot. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, indeed. So thank you for joining us from Doha today. Beautiful Doha. In fact, we've just come back from the beach. Oh, nice for some. <laughs> Uh, so, Charles, you are an adventurer, innovator, publisher, and also a parent and a husband. And, and also Margo. an all-round nice guy. Sorry? I'm also an all-round nice guy. Oh, that's important to know, actually. <laughs> and, Margot, as a nice counterbalance, you are an academic. So, thank you for joining us both today. It's lovely to have you. Uh, so we met at the London premiere of The Chase. Um, and Charles, why don't you walk us a little bit through what The Chase actually is? Yeah, thanks, Coco. And it's great to be a part of what you're doing and to talk to your audience. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, the Chase, my whole life for the last eight to 10 years has been one chase. I have been chasing something. And... I started chasing this dream of becoming an adventurer and an innovator and an explorer, uh, somebody to be able to give back to other people and to inspire other people. And after eight years of filming things that I have been doing with my snow sailor, um, I had the opportunity of connecting with Johan Nea, our award-winning director, and we finalized a documentary called The Chase, which is all about what I've been doing since I walked away from a corporate world and had a midlife crisis of some sort. So, <laughs> so your chase was also kind of subtitled Ride for Leukemia. Um, maybe tell us a little bit more about that. So when I when I went to Antarctica in 2015, I it was just post my father passing away um, after battling this horrible cancer for five or six years, and I thought that it would be a great idea to raise as much money as I possibly could for the Leukemia Foundation in Australia okay. by having people sponsor the distance that I covered when I made an attempt to get to the South Pole with my snow sailor in Antarctica. Okay. Um, and uh, whilst you were in Antarctica, it's quite a harsh and probably beautiful um, environment. Um, I imagine that you spent a lot of time there alone as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. I'm going to, like, if, if anybody wants to find out what it's like to go to Antarctica, there is a way to do this reasonably cheaply. What you need to do is you go down to your local hardware store and you buy a can of paint and a plastic bucket. You paint the inside of the bucket white. Now, please wait for it to dry and try and use a water-based paint so that you don't asphyxiate yourself and then put the bucket over your head and open your eyes. And that's what Antarctica is like. It is just an expanse of white. Wherever you look, there's white. The, the, the horizon is white. When it's white out, it's white. You, there's, no, the, the, there's no place that you can actually look at for most of the time as a landmark. Right. When, when you're sailing through the mountains, you know that there's a mountain on your left and a glacier on your right. Uh, and, and, of course, you've got a GPS, so you can follow the GPS, so you're not going to get lost. But it is just a mass expanse of white. And it's harsh, but gloriously beautiful. Um, it's friendly and unfriendly at the same time. Right. But when you've got a good crew with you, it kind of works. And when you've got support around you, that works as well. So I... Um, I'm going to go back there at the end of this year for the chase part two. 
Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But talking about support, why don't we first of all uh, touch upon how you and your lovely wife, Margot, actually met? Okay, Margot. Margot, go. <laughs> yes, Margot, and then he'll chime in. <laughs> Um, so, in fact, I didn't actually meet Words. I right. met Mr. Mawson, okay. who is a very charming, very golden, and very lovely Labrador. Is he there today? Um, he is with us today, but I think he's actually under the table. Don't get him. Mawson. Mawson. Come here. <laughs> no, come here. <laughs> he might appear later. But <laughs> quickly, Mr. Moss, up here. Right. Here we go. He, he didn't know he was. He didn't know he was <laughs> coming in, but he was he's, gonna be <laughs> he's, he's absolutely <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> from the bench. Yes. There we are. All right, this is the culprit, right? <laughs> now, this is the guilty party. Right, okay. Mr. Mawson, I don't know quite how it happened before I actually interacted with Mr. Mawson, but I assume Words had said to his buddy, Mr. Mawson, let's go for a beer down at the local pub. I was actually, I actually lived on the other side of town and I was across there for a different reason for which I actually now can't remember. And it was about five o'clock, I thought it was a Sunday, but Words tells me it was a Saturday. And I was walking back to my car um, and Mr. Mawson, as you can see how cute he is, um, and I'm very doggy, so I probably not in screenshot, but there's three others lying right. around. <laughs> um, although I didn't actually have them with me at the time. Okay. So I, you know, can't stop, you know, can't help myself but stop and talk to dogs. That's true. <laughs> so Mr. Mawson was looking very cute. It was the way it was just sitting was that I sort of walked along a pathway and Mr. Mawson was sort of more or less at my eye height. So I had a long chat with Mr. Mawson and of course Worbs <laughs> Worbs being Worbs said, Would you like to join me for a drink? Okay. So <laughs> that's how we met. So thanks to Mr. Mawson. <laughs> it was very sweet. Okay. <laughs> Very sweet. Um, and so tell us a little bit about your relationship with him, Margot. So obviously he's gone for long periods of time. He's an adventurer. It's not exactly always really safe where he's going. Um, so how does that work with you? Um, I think a couple of things. One, I have my own career. So that helps, you know, I guess the staying at home because I actually have something quite productive and important to do of my own. Um, but secondly, I think it's, I, I lived in Austria many years ago and two of my loveliest girlfriends from that time, both married adventurers. Um, right. Susie, who's actually a South African girl, married to a Dane um, and an Aussie girl called Jackie, married to a Finnish lad. And so I think I often heard those girls talk about when, you know, their lads were away. Um, particularly Susie, I remember really clearly saying one day, I don't know if Espen is going to come home until he gets off the plane. And that's because right. he was doing work in Greenland where the satellites weren't available and, you know, all those sorts of things. And my other girlfriend, um, her husband would go off on long adventures too. So I, and she had two children. So I often, I listen to those girls a lot. And I think what I learned from listening to those girlfriends was that when you, when your husband is one of these sorts of lads, you've just got to let them do their stuff. Right. You, because I think, I think the flip side is that if, if they feel that they're, they can't do those things, yeah. it's probably a worse outcome in the, in the end. Um, and so I think you've got to let them do what's important for them to do. And so I kind of know that. I just know that. Wolves will do this until he's ready to stop and only he can decide when he's finished that part of that process. Yeah. And so until he's ready, um, we thought that might have happened already. <laughs> I think it, we kind of came to a rolling stop and then went, oh, no. Yes. My mind. <laughs> Tell us about this rolling stop perhaps. Um, so after your father passing, you also had your own, your own um, actually, health scare. So... Yeah. Tell us a bit about that and how did that not stop you? <laughs> yeah, um, 2020, COVID. I, I, it was 
I'm going to preface what I tell you by saying to any male or female who has a male in their life who is watching this, if you or your man says to you he has chest pains, right. for God's sakes, get them to the hospital. Okay. That's it. That's the most important thing. Now, I had symptoms. I can remember having chest pain, but Dr. Google told me that it was indigestion. And if okay. you stretch it, move well i would and it would go away so i was convinced that it was indigestion um during COVID, we were locked down and in australia lockdown was intense we we, we could only like i could train on a bicycle by riding 10 kilometers from my front door in a certain out so you could go backwards and forwards 10 kilometers and you can do 10 of those laps and you'll do 100 kilometers but it was a day of it of, of like the business had been going through a lot of trouble because we were people driven we lost cinemas we lost engagement we couldn't have events um, it was a tough time and it was a day that i'd had a huge amount of stress and i went up to marks and i said before we walk the dogs i'm going to jump on my bike and i think what I, want, I need to do is i need to do something for myself so i'm going to go out and do a 20 kilometer time trial and see if i can do a pb right. which now the week before, I was riding the same route, right, and I landed up in the creek. Okay. I thought I must have hit something on the road that I landed up in the creek, and you know, picked my bike up, shook myself off, went home with a couple of grazers, said nothing. Went and did this time trial, came home and said to Margot, "I feel terrible," and from the start, I had pain in my chest, and right. as I rode harder it felt more and more intense and this indigestion wasn't going away. And when I got home, I know, I said to Margot, I feel like crap, I'm going to lie down. And then I said, oh, I feel better. Let's go walk the dogs. And I bent down to put one of the dogs on a lead and it felt like somebody was crushing my chest. So Margot asked me all these questions that nurses would ask, of which I answered no to all of them, but I was still bundled in a car and taken to the hospital without, without a problem. Without an argument. There was no argument. I was oh, not good. Okay. Pretty good, Margot. Well done. <laughs> One point for you. And I got to hospital. And here's another tip for all of your listeners. If you have to go to ER and you have a knife in your back or an axe in your head or you're missing half your arm, uh, tell them you've got chest pain because you're getting quicker than any other way. But honestly, I went there, I said I got chest pain, and within minutes I was rushed into a room. They put all these things on me, and they put a pill under my tongue, and the pain started going away, and I went, oh, wow, okay. this is not indigestion. But I still didn't believe it. Okay. I still didn't believe I had a heart attack because they took bloods, and about an hour later the blood test came back, and they said, no heart attack. So I immediately went to negotiate with the cardiologist about going home. Right. And Margot said, "No, I think we, I think we need to, I think we need to wait. They're going to do another test." And by that stage, I, th I was really hungry, so we ended up ordering curry delivered by Uber. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to the hospital, and. I think you were out of the room, or were you in the were you in the room when the cardiologist? No, we were eating dinner. The, when she came back at eleven. Yeah, o she came. We were eating dinner, and she walked into the room, and she said, "You're not going home." Oh, Those right. were her words. You're not going home. Okay. And I looked at Margot. Although I think she did say, "If you do, you have to sign a piece of paper." <laughs> right. Okay. It's quite dramatic. <laughs> yeah. It's quite serious because it's like if you're signing a waiver out of a hospital, they yeah. accept no obviously so I think that made Worbs think oh if I've got to sign a waiver this is quite serious yeah and and I did I I, I it was a shock it's a massive shock I cried because I'm this doesn't happen to me yeah I'm bulletproof okay. um but you face your own mortality you know I, I didn't I'm lucky that it was caught or that I was able to make, that I was fit enough to get through what wasn't that bad. All of these things, as much as the bad shit happened, the good side of it is that they put a stent in the next day and I haven't been fitter since. And how old were you when this happened? 
60, it's 20. What are we in now? 60. So I was 61. Okay. Yeah, 61. And, and four years later, I, I train harder than ever before. Um, I'm fitter than ever before. My insurance premiums are less. Okay. Because I'm no longer a risk. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Because I take that many pills in the morning that if you shake me, I rattle. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but you're here, so which is important. Oh, I'm um, here. And, and I'm, I'm here and I'm fortunate enough that I, you know, wonderful support from Margot. Yeah, I was going to ask, did your relationship with Margot change at all and it did with, uh, you know, life and the world itself? Um, I don't know if my – did the relationship change? I no, no. Yes, yes, I started listening. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Margot, yay. <laughs> because, you know, I, I knew – honestly, I you know, my that was – my middle name was Eno's. Because he right. knows everything, right? And and that was a problem. It's just like diagnosing yourself with having indigestion. But I, I did. I listened a lot more, and I've become a lot more a hugely, a lot more empathetic. There's not even a question about that. Mm -hmm. I do care. Okay. Okay. So going back to that, um, becoming more empathetic, Charles. You were married once before. Um, yeah. And what did you learn from that experience? And uh, have you become better in your second trial? <laughs> yeah, definitely become better the second time around. There's, mm. It's not even a question. I think the first time I was married, it was all, everything was driven about being successful. Right. Success and failure, right? And you're mm -hmm. so young, you don't know the definition or the difference between the two. You, right. You're in a relationship and, like, it works. You think it's working, but, like, I think Belinda and I spoke to each other at quite a bit since then, and we probably worked out that the last 10 years of our marriage was crap. Right. But I, I missed a lot with the kids. I missed a lot with, I missed obviously a lot of pointers with Belinda as well, and I wasn't around. Um, but I also know that I was probably quite immature when I did get married. Mm -hmm. And being a lot more mature when you're married the second time, you're like a lot more committed to it. I mean, hey, I worked out how to stop Margot talking, and that's that's big. Has it happened the other way around yet? <laughs> I worked it out. It's it's once. It's happened only once. How did that happen? When because I I didn't propose to Margot on oh. Christmas. We were going away to her parents in the country right. for Christmas. Margot is loading the cars with Christmas presents and all these other things. Right. Well, you tell the story. Go on. Well, I'll tell you because Wimsy is Jewish, and of course, Hanukkah, you get one present. Right. For Hanukkah every, every day, day yeah. for eight days or ten days. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, you know, bought eight or ten presents or whatever I was required to do, and I was happily packing them all in the car, quite obviously packing boxes in the car yeah. and going, no boxes for me. Can't see any boxes going in there for me. Oh, no. <laughs> and I went, oh, well, anyhow, that's all right. doesn't really matter too much. Um, and, of course, what my present was was an engagement ring, which gave right. me Christmas morning. So it was little and I didn't see it. Obviously, it took it away in his pocket. <laughs> Very sweet. Because I gave Margot a card and it, I remember because oh, I picked the card, right. the card and, and it said, I'm that committed to this relationship. Will you marry me? And after 10 minutes, I had to say, is that a yes or a no? Because she couldn't stop spluttering and blubbering. Oh. <laughs> and then you guys had a bush wedding apparently. <laughs> a bush wedding, actually. That was in, in the village where I grew up. Um, okay. And it, it was really because I think we didn't want it to be a wedding wedding. We just, I think they called it a wedding party or a, okay. I mean, oh, it sounds a bit wrong. It was because that sounds like the grooms, brides and groom, brides and groom. Yeah. Groom, bride, um, bridesmaids. I can't remember how we phrased it, but it was really around just getting all our friends together. And in actual fact, we were in the middle of the most horrendous drought. 
So it, it, it broke, I think, the year after, but it was <clears throat> probably the end of four or five years where lots of people, not my family directly, but lots of people were starting to sell stock and sell land and it was all pretty horrible. Um, and I'd, <laughs> I'd said to my mother oh, earlier on, before winter, because we had a spring wedding, I'll just grab a handful of fresh flowers out of the garden to carry. And of course, it was such a raging drought that I actually <laughs> ended up picking, I think, two um, sticks off a tree with these the, oh. the smallest little pink buds on them that I could possibly find. And I actually carried about three sticks, I think, with a bit of a pink ribbon. And um, we were we were actually the celebrant was on the tennis court, um, and it was looked like a desert, and it was just horrible. Um, so, so the land's quite romantic to me. Sounds quite romantic. <laughs> well, <a> story because <laughs> um, it, it was, I don't know, a year later. It had actually rained a year later. And it, okay. if you look at it now, like the comparative pictures are just it's beautiful and green, and you know, there's grapes across the trellis. Oh, and, right. you know, it looks lovely. Anyhow, that was our bush wedding, despite. Being in a town, we've got lots of good bushy friends and other friends, lots of city friends. You know, people came from all over. Of course, um, it was a stonking good night. I think we all. It was eleven o'clock in the morning, so it was about midnight before we all went to bed. I think finally the publican said, "You need to all go home now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, local mm. pubs they stay open until I think yeah. we could let us get sleep. But <laughs> no, Christian had a, he'd sold some liquor to some people and he had to phone them to bring the liquor back. Right. Because <laughs> the party was still going. So yeah, no, it's good night. But remember, this was in country New South Wales, which was in the middle of that horrible drought. There was nothing. It was brown. Right. And that's normally that's like they call it New England, which is normally very green. Right. Okay. Okay. So quite extreme then. We took over the town for a weekend. All the city slickers. And <laughs> and lots of and lots of our bushy friends. So it was good fun. No, oh, very sweet. Um, let's return back to your kind of adventurous side, Charles. Um, tell us about your next adventure um, that's going to happen in December. So seven years ago, you tried to cross Antarctica with your with your sailboat thingy that you made yourself. So tell us about the award that you won for that and tell us about what's going to happen this December as well. Okay. <laughs> um, I designed a... I designed it. I designed it. I, vehicle. No, it's not a vehicle. <laughs> Do you know if you want to? If you want to have, if you want to get a world record, mm. you know the easiest way to get a world record. No. It's to build something that nobody else has ever done and use it and set it as a benchmark, and you can call it a world record. <laughs> okay, so you did that, but uh, a German academy agreed with you. So you did build your thing that you're going to explain what it is, but also one of the... Designed, designed yeah. and built it in our garage. Yeah, but the Germans thought it was actually a good design and they awarded you for it. So tell us about that. And they thought that this is the best thing since sliced bread because no one's ever... And that's the Red Dot Award that we're talking about, right? So that was the Red Dot Award. It's, it's quite... I didn't realise how prestigious it was yeah, until yeah. I'd actually won it. And then you start finding out. And people... It's amazing. Other people that have won it, when you connect with them through things like LinkedIn, they'll write to you and say, hey, thanks, fellow Red Dot Award winner. And it's oh, quite wow. big mm -hmm. in, 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 in the scheme of things. So it's the, the snow sale has been an evolution over probably seven or eight years. It's now a design that I'm comfortable will go to Antarctica in December or maybe January. So December 24 or January 25 depends on weather and also transportation to and from Antarctica. And my expedition partner, Adrian McCullum, who's a scientist out of the University of the Sunshine Coast, he's a glaciologist. Okay. And yeah. And Adrian and I are heading to Antarctica, but it, it's more than the objective one is to set the world record for the fastest crossing from the South Pole to Union Glacier. Okay. 
and and we want we need to do that in less than 43 hours so that's very much the focus right now um the second part of it is that we're going to be doing some science to prove that the depth of the snow cap is actually reducing mm -hmm. so Adrian's going to have a ground probe radar on the bottom of his snow sailor, so he'll track that as he goes through. Interesting. And I'm, I'm like, passionate about, first of all, getting people to get off their backside and do things because you need to, you know, there's more to it than just sitting in front of a device. Yeah. Um, but you can also be really creative and people want to hear other people's stories, and I think every single one of us has got a story inside us. And, and that story should be told because it's going to resonate with someone somewhere. And you might change. If you can change one person's life with your story for the better, then you've done a great thing. Um, and also the STEM and STEAM education. So I, I reckon that I have this thing about you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to wear a lab coat to be a scientist. And Adrian is the epitome of this. He walks around in heavy-duty ice clothing, digging holes in the snow, doing things that, or climbing mountains and doing things that other people haven't done. So I, I want to tell this story and I want to get kids involved. I want to get them to think outside the box using a box. And I also want them to engage with us and follow us and plot how we're doing it and learn from someone like myself, and I'm not an adventurer, I'm not a professional adventurer, but people are keen on listening and seeing and helping me do what I want to do because they believe that I can make a difference. And if, if I know that people believe in me, then it makes my journey a lot easier. Okay. So, Margot, are you going with him? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I do go sometimes. Okay. Coco. It, it, I, I have quite rigid um, sort of teaching commitments um, or work commitments, so it's not always um, suitable for me to go time-wise. Um, I do when I can. Um, I've been to, you know, Norway and, and Listiari and other places, Hong Kong. Okay, Margot's not coming to Antarctica because they have yet to make a boot that will keep her feet warm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if you want to see Mar Margot go feral, cold feet. I've stood around a lot with cold feet. <laughs> Filming, and yeah, it's not good, it's ugly. <laughs> Holding your camera, you know, <clears throat> taking it again, take another shot, take another shot. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, over and over again. So I've done lots of that. But you know, I've been there with sandwiches when he comes back and stuff. I've done, you know, all those sorts of things that keep him going. Um, but but some of these ones are just too big for me, really. And and that's probably in terms of literally brute strength I'm talking, that sometimes um, I've, I've just been not strong enough to lift things or move things in a way that Adrian Cullum can. So um, Adrian's come to some adventures with us before, um, and sometimes I think it's just best that, and there's another lad there, um, just for that sort of physical support because I'm five foot one, um, you know, I'm not very tall. Sometimes I can't even reach to lift things up, you know, and I'm just not physically sometimes strong enough. Um, so, no, I'm not going to Antarctica. It's, it's a bit behind me, Antarctica. <laughs> They're doing commercial adventures anyhow. Yeah. So... How do you kind of endure when he's not away for a long, long time, months on end? Um, you don't know whether he's coming back or not. You oftentimes, you can communicate or you can't communicate when he's away on his uh, adventures, ice adventures? Yeah, in actual fact, most of the times we do. Most of the time we actually have quite good communication, possibly daily. Um, so I would say the only time I haven't been able to communicate was the clipper. Um, so that was Worbs went on an open water ocean sailing right. race between Cape Town and Sydney recently. And they, it was uh, the reason why I think there was sort of some issues around the satellites and who could actually connect off the boat. And they, had, they didn't want millions of people kind of interfering with all those navigation services. Right. Okay. So it was a really limited kind of connectivity. Although we did actually, I think, 
text each day mostly or e are you emailed or phoned every two or three days yeah it wasn't maybe? fun it was just it was email, just it was, was it? just real it was very short messaging yeah it's so like a burst so when the yeah. satellite comes over so you can load a message in right but okay. it doesn't go it That's sits right, yeah. in the it sits in the art box and when the yeah. satellite comes over the top in range and it goes boom and it'll burst all those messages out so when you get a reply I might send a message at 3 p.m. and I don't get a reply until 3 p.m. the next day because I'm busy working on the boat and you don't get a chance to check. But but yeah, but the best part is it's it's re sorry, Margot stays in connection because in today's world you can follow everything that we do. Right. But the so other good part, Paco, is I get bunches of stuff done when he's not here. <laughs> no interruptions. <laughs> I, I just get so many jobs done that I've had on my list forever. <laughs> that I need. On the weekend, we go and do stuff, right? right? And so I get bunches of stuff. So in actual fact, the first three weeks, I'm not sure I even miss it, really. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so busy kind of crossing off my jobs list. <laughs> um, I think the last time was he was away for six weeks. And I do, I do think that was nearly too, that was just a bit too long, really, at the end. Okay. So three to four weeks, I sort of feel like by the time... Get a bit of a break. <laughs> I had a break and got my jobs list done. Yeah, then that's... I come home. And six weeks last time, I think, was just getting to that point where I'm kind of going, oh, I need you back now. Yeah, yeah sweet. Tell us, Charles, um, so joking aside, you have a, wi um, a living well. What does that mean? Um, a living will is a will that you prepare that if you are in any way incapacitated and can't make a decision, that will stands. Right. So the discussion that I had with Margot is if I have a stroke, turn it off. If my heart stops beating, don't resuscitate. So you resuscitate, but if it doesn't start, stop. Right. Let me go. Okay. So it's it, the living living well is all about choice. And you know, people in any way, you you might be really sick and they want to keep pumping you full of chemicals. Well, I mean, leukemia and lymphoma didn't kill my dad. Right? That's not what killed him. That chemo killed my father. It, like just complicated everything on top of that and you do like he'd made the decision that he wanted to fight it that way and that's cool that's his choice my mum three months after dad died was diagnosed with breast cancer right and she went nah first of all the guy upstairs is not taking me because i'm not ready i've just I worked my ass I'd off. say he's not ready for his He's life. also not ready for my mum. <laughs> so he probably went, you're staying there. Um, but she she just said, you can operate and we'll do radiotherapy and that's it. And if that doesn't work, then I'm going. And she has, and that's her choice. Right. And you have to, if somebody makes that choice, you just have to accept it. So it's a discussion that I had to have with Margot and explain to Margot that, I'm sailing 5,500 nautical miles from Cape Town to Fremantle on a race with a crew that is on, off, on and off watch all the time. So at times it's different. If you die and you are more than 48 hours from port, then they put you in a bag and throw you overboard. Right. Difficult discussion to have. I'm sure. But Antarctica, sorry, would be slightly different because you would freeze. And therefore, it's easy to bring back. They can send a plane to fetch you because your insurance would then cover it. I mean, it sounds crazy, but I would far rather if I fall down a crevasse or I died out there, just leave me there, just bury me in the snow. Don't don't bring me back because it's a good place to go. I mean, who knows? You know, they might find something that they can unfreeze me in about 150 years' time and I can come back and haunt everybody else again. They are tricky conversations to have, but they're, they're yeah. necessary ones. I suspect... Yeah. They're probably conversations everyone should have anyhow. Um, I, I'm not sure that obviously Worms does things that are a bit more risky, um, and so it's imperative we have them. But I, but I think they're probably conversations that people need to have just living. Uh, you know, if we think about 
there's probably more chance of being hit by a car somewhere than yeah. potentially having someone like Worbs, you know, fall off the you know, boat capsize and they all die. So, I mean, they're, they're probably conversations everyone should have. We just must have them. But you have to have them with your kids as well. Oh, interesting. Okay. How did that go? Um, I have to have four discussions. And then I have right. to have, and then the fifth one I can't have, the fifth one is the one I have to have with my mum where I have to tell my mum what I've done. Because I can't discuss that with her. But, yeah, so you have to have it with Margot and then I had to sit down and in, in the instant I had, to, I had to have the same discussion with my business partner. Right. Okay. And he went, whoa, like we haven't prepared for this. Well, no, but this is what it is. So it's I, I suggest that people just in every like Margot just said, in the everyday life, you need to think about these things. Like God forbid if somebody had to take my legs away from me in a car accident, I'd rather bleed to death than be in a wheelchair. And that's I haven't got anything against people in wheelchairs. I just don't want to be one of those guys. Right. Sounds very selfish. But at how times, did, how did your children react to your living will? How did your children react to your living will? Oh, the kids think that I'm the biggest kid, Coco. Okay? Right. So, so, so that's where it starts, right? They, they, and the kids actually understand, like Margot, what I do. And as long as Dad's doing it, then Dad's in a really good space because they've exactly. seen Dad in such a good space, right? So when they know I'm happy then they're incredibly happy. And, you know, as long as they've got copies of the insurance certificate, I'm sure they're okay. <laughs> I mean, you have to joke about it. I know it's like... You do. I agree. Okay, I agree. You have to make light of it because you don't, You just don't know. I could cross yeah. the street and somebody could take me out. So, But all the, all, the, all the kids are very sensible and pragmatic, so I think that they're all very... They are sensible. And You're right, and pragmatic. And You're right. right. Yeah. So I think that... But in the event of anything happening, I think they would be very easy to work with and, you know, deal with the, all the bits that go with that. Yeah. Okay, good to hear. Yeah, tough topic. Um, just returning yeah. back to the chase and the fact that you had already tried to um, reach a world record, but that didn't happen for you. Let's talk a little bit about failure. Is there such a thing as failure or how do you see that? The only people that fail are people who don't make any attempts in life. Agreed. That's it. I, it's harsh, but it's, it, you know, there, there, <laughs> there, there, are, there are opportunities that present themselves to every single person every single day you just need to be open to those opportunities and if you're open to those opportunities then you'll have a crack at doing something doing something just a little bit different mm. and 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 by 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 doing that you're actually taking a bit of risk and when you take a bit of risk when it when you just when you take some risk just the endorphins kick in and they go oh my god what a great thing that is like wow like, but what's the definition of success? Is it do you put it in medals? Do you put it in awards? Do you put it in financial terms? Or do you just put it in where you can get into go bed at night and go, fuck, I've just done something that no one else has ever done and I can tick that box? And that's the world I kind of, I would love to see more people getting involved in that because if you do that, then you start understanding other people and if you understand other people then there's a chance that you can actually talk to other people and when you talk to other people you can resolve things as opposed to all these other crap things that happen around the world that yeah i feel that oftentimes people don't try new things because of this fear of failure and what will others say and what will happen if i fail but why worry about, yes, and this is, I mean, this is the world we live in, right? We live in a society where people judge us, but they judge us on, on, a, on, a, on a social media platform. Mm, right. Right? Like, if you don't have LinkedIn and you don't have Facebook and you don't have Insta and you don't have Twitter, well, then people can't judge you. Think about yeah, it. True. <laughs> Very true. But we all want those things because we're all seeking some form of affirmation. Right. So... 
I don't go out there to do it to win awards. I go out there to do it to prove that it can be done. And I, look, the journey to make the journey happen is yeah. far more exciting than the journey itself. Yeah. Right? And yeah. and I love that. And that's the chase. Coco, Coco, that oh, is. nice. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. So the chase is better than the result, you're saying. Yeah, exactly. And and I would just you know people people need to just get out there and think about these things and do something they've never ever done before. I, I say to people, so you you walk, yeah. Where do you walk to? I walk on the beach and I go, well, why don't you put a backpack on with a tent and then walk along the beach and then round the beach and then the next that night sleep under fifty million stars and then go and have breakfast the next morning. And I can tell you that the next day will be a completely different day to any day that you've ever experienced. Well, mm -hmm. and that's not, well, get on your bicycle and instead of just riding to work, sit on your bicycle for five hours and go and ride or six hours and ride a hundred kilometer race. <laughs> I don't, you know, I do bike races to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always, again, I come back to the word chase, but I'm chasing the fitness levels, I'm chasing the endorphins, I'm chasing the goal. Right. Right, so I had a heart attack and I think, what, four weeks after my heart attack, I said to my guy, I've just entered the 115 kilometer Brisbane to Bay bike race. She goes, yeah, you, you've never ridden that. I said, I know, but we'll get there. And so you, Every week you just chase more kilometers, mm. chase more kilometers the next week, and eventually you get on your bike and you ride it. Amazing. Yeah. And if you don't finish it, so what? You haven't failed. I think that's the you've, key. It you've doesn't matter. You've, you've, done you've, ridden, you've done something that you've never ever done before. Yeah. So I didn't make it to the South Pole. So what? But yeah. I was the first person to ever snow sail in Antarctica. Amazing, yeah. And won, and won an award for your little pod that you made yourself. <laughs> won an award for my bike. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So just looking at you guys and listening to your stories and all these adventures, um, what makes your relationship between yourselves just so solid that you can kind of withstand and endure all this? Go on. Uh, I, I mean, that's really hard to, to um, I guess, put into words, really. But I think, I think it's really around that that when we, so we do spend time apart for a range of different reasons. You know, I go home to visit elderly parents. You know, there's other kind of times too. Yeah. I think it's about the time that we are together is really valuable and we do spend a lot of well, all our time together, really, when we're together. So I think outside grocery shopping. Right. <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> so, um, I, think, I, I think that, you know, even things like, you know, we both work in our offices here and we come and have lunch together during the day. Um, we walk the dogs together in the afternoon. On the weekends, we go to the beach together with the dogs. So, you know, um, I will go, happily go to football games with Worbs. Um, we don't get to go to lots of opera. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it's really around, I do have a sense that, you know, play together is a stay together kind of motto for me. Um, and, and while life can mean that there are times when you can't be together, yeah, and maybe that that independent time is also part of the success, right? I do think that when we're together, we don't have separate lives; that we have very similar lives. We do things together, and while we have different jobs and different careers, and you know, we work in different spaces in that way, um, we we fundamentally, I guess, work together, don't we? Yeah. If you if you if you know what you have, then if you know what you've had and you weren't happy with that, but you know what you have now and you're happy with that, 
I can go on an expedition and the last thing I worry about is my goat. Okay. Okay. Now, what does that tell you? Like, Margot is more than capable of doing everything that needs to be done. And when I come home, I know that Margot's still going to be there waiting for me to walk through the door and give me a big hug and a cuddle and say, I missed you. And I was more excited about you doing your expedition than you were. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it, it's, I don't know if there are still, I don't know if there are many people. I mean, we do, we literally, you wake up, we have breakfast together every morning. Sweet. We stop and have lunch together every day That we, when we're working in the same room. Oh, yeah. not the same room, but in the, the same, same house. The same house. Very sweet. And we sit down and have dinner together. So, and yet we're both very, very independent. And I can be incredibly selfish which I kind of have to be at times in order to do what I do. Right. But I still, you know, I ask for affirmation. So is it okay <laughs> if I go and train for three hours? <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's very yeah. sweet. Yeah. Then I get on the go and do and train for three hours and I don't care. When I come back, you can't say to me, why did you go and train for three hours? Right. See, I'm just really <laughs> practical because I'm like going, we've got four dogs. And I can't walk four of them together. So I need someone to help me. So I'm just really pragmatic quite often, Coco, around, you know, kind of getting all those things done. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, it like work, works really well and it's easy. Right. Very sweet. So. It's at each other on all things along the way. Say that again. I th although I think we do crack the shits with each other on certain things. I know Margot's always telling me I walk, I walk too fast through an airport. <laughs> it's a very specific gripe. Because <laughs> yeah. he forgets sometimes that my legs are half the length of his. <laughs> he strides like you've got no idea, particularly when he's on a mission. And I'm like going, maybe I'll just stay here and duck behind the counter and wait and see how long it is before he realises that I'm not behind him. <laughs> Longer. It might be tomorrow, Margot. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, slow down. I don't think that's happening anytime soon by the looks of things. <laughs> no, that's right. No. Why? Like, if you can do it, or if I can still do it, and, and I'm so driven to do it, you know, it's about, it's about, doing the expedition and, and, and all the things leading up to it. So making it very, very interactive for people. And then it's about making a film and telling that story and, and, and making a full length documentary on it. And then maybe we'll think about slowing down a little, definitely slow down a little bit after that. Definitely. definitely right. <laughs> no, because the, the, the thing is that, you know, I've spent so much time developing this thing that I need to now make some money out of it. So I'm going, I, I want to be, I have not monetized this at all because I didn't want anybody else to do it before me. Okay. So once I've done it, I can monetize it and that just becomes the next chase. Okay. So it might not be as physical, but mentally it'll be just as exciting. Amazing. To watch uh, the thing at the start of a James Bond film would be pretty cool. <laughs> that would be actually very good. <laughs> it's, you, you need to put it out there if you want it, right? <laughs> yeah, but you've got to prove that it can do it. <sighs> that is true. Um, so just kind of to end this uh, amazing chat with you two, uh, what advice would you give to viewers and listeners who are perhaps struggling with uh, going after their dreams or are scared or don't know what to do? And kind of what would you say to, yeah, just to people who do not go out and chase their dreams? There's nothing that'll hold you back or that can hold you back other than yourself. So my passing would be confront your fears and live your dreams. Nice. I think my contribution would be is that I think for people like Worms, 
it's easier to see that in one piece. I think for other people, it's about doing steps at a time. So I, I think personalities are different and Wurbsy, I think, has the right sort of personality to just go, I'm going to do that. Right. And there's start and finish. And Wurbs, I don't think, has a lot of, initially, a lot of vision about what the process is. He kind of works it as he goes along. That would be a fair The thing. journey about making the journey happen yes. is far greater than the journey Gen itself. itself. <laughs> yeah. So I think Webster just goes, I'm going to do that. That's my end goal. I'm going to right. work as I go along. I don't think that works for everyone. I think I'm quite different in the personality type of we plan but diff in different ways. And so I would manage bigger things in much more incremental type of steps. So I think that's recognising a personality type okay. and reflect on what people, those individuals can manage that's feasible and realistic and pragmatic right. rather than feeling like the goal is too far away and that stops you doing anything. So, And if you only do one step, well, then that's okay. But that, and that's not failing. No, no, that's one step. Yeah, Taking that's, that one step. Yeah. That's right? Nice. So, you know, the, the worst thing is I, I, I hate it when people set goals for the new year. Right. Or they set budgets in business. Like one of my biggest gripes is when I have to have a budget meeting with my business partner. <laughs> because if you set a budget, you're mm. stopping yourself from attaining the attainable right because if you say i'm going to get x amount of dollars then when you get there you go i made budget great but if you have a stretch and you go times budget how much better would you feel so Decide I'm going to ride 10 kilometres. When you've ridden 10 kilometres, next day go and do 11. Right. Just the and, comes. Yeah, but if you can only get to 15 and you can't do more than 15, well, you know what? You were, you're doing 15 kilometres when a week ago or two months ago, whatever, you were doing one. You haven't failed. You've done 15. Tick the box. It's a great thing to do, but just stay there. And if you work hard at that 15, eventually you'll do 15.1 and then 15.2 and then 16, and then 19, and then 25, etc. And that's how you should make these life choices. So basically, keep chasing. Follow. <laughs> chase. That's why it's called the chase. That's it. <laughs> Margot and Charles, thank you so much for being my guest. It was a pleasure hosting you both. And have thank you very much indeed. We've been thank you. It was great. <laughs> Enjoy your day and I hope to see you guys soon. Bye. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.